You're listening to the Jewel City Podcast. To help spread the gospel of Jesus, give us a five-star rating. That'll help bump us up in the podcast platforms. Additionally, make sure you share it with your friends. In this podcast, we're going to hear a Sunday morning message. That's right. You can go ahead and have a seat this morning. And if you didn't notice, Pastor Robert is not here um, today. He is uh, visiting Pastor Dave Marsh and Patty at Crossroads Church this morning and preaching for them. And so we hope they're doing well. So this morning we get the privilege of hearing from our very own Pastor Rita Robinson. So would you make her welcome as she comes? Joel City, you're looking good this morning. Look at your neighbor and say, you're looking good. But I didn't come to see you. I come to see Jesus this morning. How many of you need a touch from Jesus? And since pastor isn't here, he can't ask you, so I will. Has Jesus been good to anybody in the house this morning? Yes. Done anything for anybody here this morning? I'm telling you, you're looking good. I feel like I have a word from the Lord this morning, but... Um, a little bit like Pastor always like to start off with something a little funny. That's just me. And I told the girls in the back, I said, the more amens I hear, the shorter the message will be. And they amened me all the way up the aisle. So I feel like I already owe you about seven minutes, okay? Now, I wanted to tell you this little story. I looked high and low, but I don't know any new jokes. So you're going to get an old one. Okay, so pretend like you've never heard it. Laugh anyway. Okay. Uh, There was this third grade teacher, and she was trying to get her kids to want their picture taken as a class so that uh, they could all just have a picture with her and all their classmates. And the classmates just didn't show any interest or want to do it. And she said, now, you'll want to do this. You'll want to get your picture taken. She said, uh, just think, she said, maybe 25, 30 years from now, you'll pick up that paper and say, well, look, there's Steve Riddle. He's a big brain surgeon now. And look over there, there's Lynn. He's He's a big engineer and headed for the moon. And look at Rita Robinson. She's a big uh, United States televangelist now. Just look at all that. And one little boy piped up in the back and said, yeah, look at teacher. She dead. (laughs) Thank you. Okay. If you have your Bibles, that's good. If you don't, that's okay. I'm going to read anyway. I'm going to read from the book of Mark this morning, chapter 8, verses 22 through 26. Now, I'll just tell you at the beginning, there were some synoptic gospel writers that were eyewitnesses. Mark was not an eyewitness, but he got his information from Peter, okay? So Mark evidently had been talking to Peter, and here's a story that Peter told Mark one day. It says, and he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, that's Jesus, and led him out of town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked the blind man if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And he put his hands up again on his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell any to it in town. Now I'm also going to read from Matthew 11, 20 through 22. It says, then began he, Jesus, to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin, and woe unto thee, Bethsaida, For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented in sackcloth and ashes. But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. Okay, I want to take you back a little over 2,000 years ago. Now, I'm a visual person. I like to picture things. 
And so our account today in Mark 8 had to happen something like this. I want you to picture Jesus inside the city of Bethsaida. Okay, I want you to picture him. I don't know what he's doing at this particular time. Maybe he's outside standing in the dusty street. And maybe he's talking to a crowd of people. And when somebody else comes up to speak, I can see him. He was just as much human as you and I. And so he, he maybe if someone else would come up, he would cover his uh, face and eyes to shield his eyes from the, the hot eastern sun. And he would look at them as they come up. And he was just talking, and they were interested in Jesus. He was the talk of the town, you know. One talk was uh, good, and the other talk was not so good. Jesus uh, caused a little bit of stir and commotion everywhere he went, and he still does today. You mentioned the name of Jesus, okay? You're either for him or you're either against him, okay? Okay, there's no middle road. You either know Jesus or you don't know Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is talking inside the city of Bethesda, Bethesda, and all of a sudden, there's some commotion over to one side. And Jesus looks over to one side. Now picture this. There's some men that has another man by the hand, and they're dragging him. They're pulling him. They're, they're, they're pulling him. I can just see this one man with his heels kind of planted in the dusty road like, I'm not going. They said, you're going. And they pulled him and they took him and they stood him in front of Jesus. And here's what they said to Jesus. This man's blind. Heal him. Touch him. So the first thing I want you to notice was that this man did not go to Jesus on his own. Okay, he was blind. And he did not go to Jesus on his own. I want to concentrate on this man for just a little bit and the miracle that he received from the Lord. Because just two chapters over, in Mark chapter 10, there was a blind man, another blind man. I'm not going to concentrate on him, but I'm going to mention him. One day he got up early of a morning and he made sure that his tin cup was in his pocket. He felt there it was. You know, back in those days, if you were handicapped in any way, if you were crippled, if you were blind, or for any reason you could not work. They kind of had their own uh, system of welfare, maybe let's call it, back then, because what they would do, the government would issue a coat, and it had certain collars, and that gave you permission. If you had a certain coat on, you could go out and sit in the dusty street or sit on a chair or bench of some sort and beg for money. So this morning, this one blind man, not in, Lu in Mark 8, but in Mark 10, he gets up, he fills his 10 cups there, he puts on his beggar's coat. And it says, and I don't know if he had someone to lead him to the gates of the city, or if he had just been blind all of his life and he knew he could feel his way, or if he had a stick, a tapping stick, and he would go to the gates of the city. And once he got to the gates of the city, where the people would come and go, there was more traffic there, kind of like up there on Bridgeport Hill, up there by Wall greens. You know, that's a big wall, uh, bottleneck. He found himself a bottleneck. He said, wherever the traffic's coming, that's where I want to be. And when he got to where he wanted to be, he reached down in his pocket and pulled out his tin cup. And he began to hold it up and, and beg for alms. Alms, somebody have mercy, have pity on me, I can't work. And they would see his beggar's coat and knew that he had legal permission to sit there in the dust. And people would drop money. Remember the blind man that used to sit in front of G.C. Murphy? years ago. I remember him. He lived at Reynoldsville. And when I would drop something and you could hear it hit the bottom of his cup, he would say, God bless you. God bless you. And he would just thank you. Sometimes, you know, it, and it came from the bottom of his heart. You just wanted to throw more in because it blessed him and he couldn't work for a living. So this blind man in Mark 10 was sitting by the wayside and people would drop coins in his cup when all of a sudden, above all the commotion, above all the thunder of the footsteps that was going in and out of the gate, he heard somebody say, Jesus is passing by. And the blind man said, Jesus, I've heard that name before. Jesus, where have I? Jesus, I've heard he does miracles. I hear he can raise the dead. He can heal the sick. The crippled men walk and the blind men see. He probably thought, hot dog, this is my day, Jesus. And it says, and he lifted his voice and here's what he said in Mark 10, Jesus, thou son of David, 
I'm over here. Over here I am. Jesus, have mercy on me, thou son of David. And he said, the crowd tried to shut him up. And if you'll notice, it's interesting enough, Cindy, that most of the crowd was church people. They tried to shut him up. They were on their way to and fro the temple, and they said, shh, Jesus doesn't have time for you. And they tried to hush him up. But what did this blind man say? It said, he cried out all the more. He just said, huh? you ain't seen nothing yet. You're trying to shut me up? You haven't seen the worst yet. And it says, he cried out all the louder. And he said, Jesus, thou son of David, the healer of the blind, I'm over here and I need some help. I need a touch today. I need somebody to come. Come by and touch my eyes and change my life and give me a miracle. And you know what Jesus did? I love this. I love it. And I read it over and over. It said, and Jesus stood still. Man, he stood still. Can't you see it? The crowd was following. I just like the picture. I'm a visual. Everybody bumping into one another. Bumping. Well, what's he standing for? He was moving. What's it? And Jesus stood still. And he said, somebody go get that blind man and bring him to me. And you know what? When the blind man heard, somebody went over and said, hey, hey, dude, he's calling for you. He wants you. Oh, I would just like to have had his vitals right about then, wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like to have seen his pulse and his respiration about then? Oh, no, he's calling for me. I can see it now. You know what? I just like to vision this. And it happened something like this. He took his tin cup and he threw it in the dust. And it's the Bible says that when he stood up, Becky, you know what he did? He took his beggar's coat off. Now he was still blind. He still couldn't see, but he anticipated something coming. He knew something good was on its way. So you know what he did? He took his beggar's coat off, Scotty, and he threw it in the dust. And when he threw it in the dust, they led him to Jesus. And Jesus asked a question. He said, what do you want from me? And that blind man didn't have to think. He didn't have to say, let me pray about it. He didn't say, I'll get back with you. He said that I might receive my sight. And Jesus touched him and the blind man went home different than he came. Okay? Now when he went home, I believe he took it a long way home. And he thought, oh, I don't need the stick anymore. I'll leave the stick and the coat and the cup in the dust. I don't need it anymore. And he walks home and people say, well, isn't that, isn't that blind man? I just threw some coins in his cup just about a half hour ago. But the blind man was on his way home. Now, I bring that point out. I don't want to dwell on that blind man. I want to dwell on Mark chapter 8 blind man. Okay? He comes to Jesus not willingly. His friends have him by the hand. And they're dragging him. They're pulling. You are going to Jesus. You are. And they pull him. And when they got him in front of Jesus, all wore out. They said, Jesus, there he is. Heal him. You know, as I was preparing this message, I thought, wouldn't that be great if it happened like that today? (laughs) Don't you just know somebody you'd like to get by the hand and say, you're going if you want to or not. (laughs) Jesus, this man needs saved. He don't know he needs saved, but he needs saved. Save him. Oh, I got some family members. I've got some friends that I just love to get them by the hand and drag him to Jesus and say, Jesus, he doesn't know, but he don't want to go to hell. He doesn't know, but there's only a heaven or a hell and he's on his way one place or the other. Jesus touched you, but we can't do that, can we? Don't you just want to see some people they are going through difficult times. When I say something like divorce, when I say something like debt, when I say something like disease, when I say something like depression, which is most of my counseling now, depression, don't you just want to just kick some people and say, I know your answer. You're not bright enough maybe to know your answer, but here, give me your hand. I'm going to take you to Jesus. And so they said to the blind man, you're not smart enough to go on your own, but I'm going to take you to Jesus. And they took him to Jesus and immediately Jesus saw the problem. And what did he do? I like this. Now I can remember and those of you that have heard me speak have heard this before. I can remember one time I had to speak at Faith Fellowship years ago, years and years ago 
And I was living on 20th Street. And I can remember, I, was, I, know, I can take you right where they wouldn't like it now because I don't own the house. But I could take you to the house and take you in the house and show you right where I was standing when the Lord spoke to me and, and answered my question. I can remember, I said, Lord, why did you have to touch that one blind man twice? Nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in his three and a half years on earth did he have to touch anybody twice. This is the only gradual miracle that you'll read of in the Gospels. Why did you have to touch him twice? I know you didn't make a mistake. I know you didn't lack the power. Why did you touch him twice? All night I'd ask him as I lay in my bed there in the bedroom on 20th Street in Northview. I asked him. I fell asleep and the next morning I was taking a shower and the Lord spoke to me and you can't talk me out of it. The Lord spoke to me and he said, it was his attitude. And the reason, so I know that it was this blind man. You see, he wasn't born blind. He knew what men looked like. I read it in my text. He knew what trees looked like. He said, I see men walking as trees. And so he knew. So there was something. It had been an accident. It had been a, um, a disease. But something had taken his eyesight. And so he was bitter. He got angry. How many of you know that when trouble comes into your life, when disaster comes, when sickness and divorce and, de and, and death comes into your life, it's going to make you bitter or better? One of the two. You can go either direction. This man, the blind man, had gotten bitter. And so he didn't even care to go to Jesus. He didn't care if he ever saw again. But you know one thing else that the Holy Spirit, like Carrie was talking about this morning, the Holy Spirit showed me the blind, Jesus didn't touch the blind man twice. You know what he did? It says here, and it says, and they said, touch him, touch him. This man's born blind, touch him. You know what Jesus did? It says, and he took him by the hand. Jesus reached out and took his hand. Okay, no COVID back then. Okay, Jesus reached out and took him by the hand. Now, I like this. That was the first touch. That was the first touch. Jesus squeezed his hand and he said, follow me, dude. And he led him out of the city. He took him out of Bethsaida. Now, I read to you two texts in your hearing. The title of my message today is Blind, Blurred, Blessed. So today, you're either blind, you're sitting in this church blind, you're sitting in this church blurred, or you're sitting in this church blessed. We have any blessed people out there today? Any blessed people? Okay, we got some blessed people out there. Blind, blurred, and blessed. Jesus took him by the hand and led him out of the city. Let me tell you something else the Holy Spirit showed me. I'm going to tell you, Indy, that the blind man was not the only blind person in my text. The whole city of Bethsaida was blind. Okay, the entire city was blind. That's not, not physically, but they were spiritually blind. That's why Jesus took his hand and said, I got to get you out of Dodge. I got to get you out of Bethsaida. Because he said, I've done so many good works. I read it to you in my text. I've done so many good works here. Man, I've done miracles here. I've taught great messages here. I've done great things. And they don't believe. They don't believe anything. If I would have preached the same sermons and taught the same lessons and did the same miracles over there in Tyre and Sidon, they would have already repented. They would have had revival. There had been something good going on over there. But no, you guys have listened. You've turned a deaf ear. You don't want to hear anything. So they were blind to the things of God. Okay, so Jesus took the hand of the blind man and he led him out of the environment. And he led him out of a blind city. And when he got to the outskirts of the city, he began to have a conversation with him. You know, I've never been to a bar. I've never, never had a drinking problem, never had a drink of anything in my entire life. But I've heard pastor, pastor said when he used to sit on the bar stool, okay? And he said, finally, one day he realized he needed to get out of the bars. So what did he do? He looked at his buddy sitting next to him and he said, buddy, I like you. I've liked being your friend, but you won't see me in this bar anymore. I'm not coming back. You know, Jesus had got a hold of pastor and changed his life. So some 
sometimes we, if we want to heal, we have to get out of the environment we're in. You know, we have to get out of wherever we're at. We can't surround ourselves with unbelievers and expect to be healed. Now, we're, we're, to, we're to minister to the unbelievers and we're not to shun them. You know, Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost. But Jesus took him by the hand and let him out. And then he looked at him and it said, he spit on his hand. And then he touched his eyes. And he said to this man, what do you see now? Now that I've led you out of the blind city, what do you see? And the blind man looked. And he said, man, my vision is not what it should be. He said, uh, I see men, but they're walking as trees. Everything's blurry. I don't have 20-20 vision. And I want to tell you, Jesus was impressed with his honesty. Now, here's what the Holy Spirit impressed upon me to tell you today, and that's this. I believe there's a lot of people in this room today, a lot of people that are saved. You are not blind. You are on your way to heaven. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life and you're on your way to heaven. However, I believe there's also a multitude of people in this and in every church and in this nation and in this world that are not blind, but they're not blessed. They're living in a blurred state. How many of you know that you can live in a blurred state? And I want to tell you one reason why I know that a majority of people are living in a blurred state is because I know, and I've been around, and I've been on this planet long enough, and I've been in counseling long enough to know that in every pew, I could go every pew here from the front to the back, from the left to the right, there's pain in every pew. I know that I could say something and you could smile and smile, but eventually I can say somebody's name or I can say a sin or I can say something and it'll bring tears to your eyes. I could come to you and, some of, and say divorce. And some of you, I can see your chin begin to quiver. I can see all these things begin to happen and your eyes begin to tear up. I could say some of you, the loss of a loved one. I could say some of you, uh, you're taking out bankruptcy. You're in debt. I could say uh, the, uh, many things. I know some people, times I can be laughing and look at someone's picture on my refrigerator and pain grips my heart. Sorrow and sadness grip my heart. There's pain in every pew. But yet Sunday after Sunday, when the speaker, especially pastor, because he does most of the speaking, when he says, how many of you here need just a touch from Jesus today? Just a touch. I don't believe there's anyone in this congregation today. I don't believe there's one one person that doesn't need a touch of some sort in their life that needs a touch or if you maybe if you're sitting there and you're perfectly healthy you're young you can see and you're perfectly healthy you can't tell me that you don't know someone that needs a touch that needs saved that needs delivered that needs filled with the Holy Spirit uh, that needs touched that needs touched in some way so we sit here though a lot of times and you know what it's the, sometimes the same people that come to the altar not for salvation but for a touch. It's the same people. They're like the blind man in chapter 10. Man, let me get to Jesus. If I can just get to Jesus, he's going to turn things around for me. He's going to change my life. He's going to change my future. He's going to give me something to hope for. But then some of you are like the blind man in chapter 10. I'm going to sit in chapter 8. I'm going to sit right here. You know, I'm, I'm going to sit right here in my blurred condition. You know, I have found, now I'm, I'm, I'm not a doctor nor a nurse, but I've got 42 years in radiology, okay? So I know that when your eyes are blurred, a lot of times it is your eyes. But blurred eyesight, you know, the etiology of blurred vision is not always your eyes. Sometimes it can be a migraine. Sometimes it can be diabetes. Sometimes it can be other diseases, and it affects your vision. So I believe that sometimes when some of us sit out there in a blurred state, we're out there, we're not seeing clearly. We're not as blessed as we could be, not as blessed as we should be. We're living our lives in a blurred condition. It's because there's an underlying condition of some sort. There's something else going on. Maybe we too are bitter. bitter. Maybe we too are angry, but there's something else going on and we sit out there in a blurred state. But let me tell you one thing. Jesus 
His honesty of the blind man impressed Jesus. And sometimes I don't think that it's necessarily the blind man's faith that healed him. It was his honesty that healed him. In other words, he was saying, man, I'm not like I was when you took my hand and led me out. I can see better, but I still can't see clearly. I have t- don't have 20-20 vision. It's blurred. And Jesus was impressed with his honesty. And I believe a lot of the times the church is not honest. We're afraid to let people know that we have a need. We're afraid to walk up front. What will people think? What will people think? Will they think that I'm depressed? Will they think that I'm going through a divorce? Will I, there's trouble at home? Will they think that I've got financial issues? What will people think? I want to tell you something. If I knew someone was right up here and all I had to do was walk up here and they could change my life, they could fix my problem, you're going to, I'm going to elbow you and get you out of my way because I'm going to get to Jesus. I'm going to get to someone one that can change my life, give me 20-20 vision, and take me out of the blurred condition that I am living in. So Jesus said, ha, ah, your, your eyesight's not what it was, huh? But he was dealing with his attitude. You know, a lot of, some of you need an attitude adjustment. Okay, and how do I know? I counsel some of you. Some of you need an attitude adjustment, okay? All right, and so a lot of times, you know, we got some stinking thinking going on up here, okay? And if you've never had some stinking thinking, you're not being honest with yourself. Like Pastor said, some of you are telling the truth, and the rest of you, well, you're maybe not telling the truth, okay? You know what happens? Revelations 21 8, I like to paraphrase it. If you lie, you fry. Okay, so we need to start telling the truth and get out of the blurred condition that we're living in. So Jesus was thrilled and he was dealing with his attitude because the blind man all of a sudden remembered what it was like to be able to see. All of a sudden he had a thirst. Man, I remember this. I I forgot how bright the sky was. I forgot, oh, the sun. And all of a sudden, it created a hunger in him to be able to see again. And so he, that's what Jesus was doing, was dealing with his attitude. I wish some of you, Jesus would deal with your attitude that you can remember what it was like to walk in victory. That's what you can remember to, what it's like to get up with a song in your heart and then just dance all day and everything. I can remember not long ago, Adam, when he plays the keyboard, when he plays for a pastor and plays this little song, uh, I can't even walk without you holding my hand. He puts a little run in there that I like. And, and I like that little run that he puts in there. And I thought, my goodness, well, not long ago when they had that little music uh, uh, shop around here and everything, and I was working with Adam, I said, Adam, show me how you do that little run. What do you do? Show me your fingers. I'm going to watch you. And he put his hands in. I said, what key you in? He said, I'm in the key of G. And he went, brum, bum, 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 bum. And I went home and I thought, hmm, I can do that run. And so I was going, brum, bum, bum, and wasn't turning out just right. And I kept it up and kept it up and kept it up and kept, brum, bum, bum, bum. Finally, my door opened. And it was my father's other daughter. She came in and she said, are you having trouble with the cord? And I said, yes. She said, I can hear it. Learn it. And cut it out. I'm done. I'm, I'm, you're getting on my nerves. So I brought her over the other day and I said, listen to this. And I can't even walk. I learned that little run. I remembered what it's like. I'm telling you, you need to learn to know what it's like to walk in victory. To get up with a song in your heart. To go to bed with a song in your heart. Why the world is falling apart. But I know the one who has the world in his hands. I know the one that's got it all under control. So there's no sense in me and God both staying up all night worrying about it. So I just say, good night, God. I'm going to go sleep. You can worry. You can do whatever you want to do. I'm going to put it in your hands. We need to learn to get out of a blurred state and walk in victory. Okay. So I'm going to wind this up before too long, but I want to tell you the blind man, after Jesus touched him, here's what he said. He said, man, I see, can see clearly now. That sounds like a song. I can see clearly now. Okay. And he took him by the hand. And here's what he said. I just led you out of a blind city. Don't go back in. Don't go back into what I just led you out of. And so 
You and I need to learn that once he saves us and cleans us up, we can't go back where we came from. We might go back and stand at the door and pass out some tracks and say, here's where I'm going to church now because Jesus took me out of this blind place. He touched me. He gave me 20-20 vision, and I've come back after you. I'd like you to get out of this place. So we have to uh, learn to walk in victory. So much of the church is not walking in victory today. And you'll notice today when we give the altar call and say, is there anybody here that doesn't know Jesus, that doesn't know Jesus, you're blind and you need your eyes open. The song that that Nancy sang this morning was, I was blind, but now I see. And so don't go back where you came once Jesus led you out of where you are. I read something in one of my books that says, if you don't want to deal with the devil, stay out of his shop. You can't go in his shop and shop around and expect to walk in victory. Stay out of his shop. So I just ask you today, okay? There were two men, two blind men, two different responses. And I'm asking you today to put yourself on the agenda of Jesus. In other words, there were so many times when Jesus walked this earth, he would walk down a dusty street. And you could tell by the end of the day, all of a sudden, when you walk down a dusty street, let's just say that you were from one city and now you're going to Bethsaida that day, okay? And you look down and you see 10 cups and you see beggar's coats and you see canes and you see lepers' bandages and you see all of these things. You see crutches and everything and you get to the end of the road and you look at somebody and say, what on earth went on in this city today? And they'll raise their eyebrows and their eyes widen and they say, why haven't you heard? Jesus passed by today and these people don't need these paraphernalia things anymore because Jesus passed by. What kind of a crutch or a cane or a bandage are you wearing today? You can leave it here today day at the altar when you leave because Jesus is passing by this way today. And Jesus is passing by this way to touch you. Okay, so we just need a touch from Jesus. I can see Jesus walking down a dusty street. Can't you? Can you see him now? He's at an intersection. And he looks over here and there's a funeral going on. And he sees mama crying. And there's a young man laying on the funeral bier, on the stretcher there. And what does Jesus do? His heart is gripped with the compassion. The disciples want to walk on. But Jesus said, just a minute. And Jesus goes over and he touches the funeral bier and he says to the mother, it's going to be okay, don't cry anymore. I will take care of this. And he touches the funeral bier and the dead men set up. How many of you know when the dead set up, the funeral's over? <laughs> he set up and mama took that young man home. Jesus couldn't go to funerals. He had a way. The dead came back to life every time he went to a funeral. If you're here today, he wants to touch you and give you some life. But some of you will go home the same way you came. You'll go home the same way you came. And then you'll be complaining, oh, I'm this and that. I'm telling you, it's time to change and turn around. It's time to do something about the state in which you're living. The little old woman that had the blood issue, and this is my last example, okay? The little woman that had the blood issue, she peeked out of her window one day, bumped back the curtain. Well, I think that's Jesus coming down the dusty road. I like to hear Nancy sing, there's a miracle coming down your dusty road. And she said, that is Jesus. And look at the crowd around him. Oh, man, I know it's against the law, me, a woman, to get out in the dusty road. I know I can't talk to the Jew. I know I can't touch him. They might put me in jail. But what she say, hot dog, if I go to jail, I'm going to go healed. I'm going to go healed. There's going to be a change made in my body. She hobbles down her dusty, her steps. She gets out in the dusty road, and she puts herself on the agenda of Jesus. And she follows him. She just missed the hem of his garment. Just missed it. She tries again. Jesus took another step. And then finally she goes out and she touches him. And all of a sudden Jesus stood still again. Don't you like it when Jesus stands still? Things happen when Jesus stands still. Okay. Jesus is going to be up here in a little bit standing still. Oh, you're not going to be able to see him. Don't call a shrink or anything. He's not going to be here. But he is going to be here with your spiritual eyes. You can see him. Okay. So Jesus stood still, and all of a sudden he said, Who touched me? It's always Peter. The only time Peter opened his mouth was to change feet. Always had his foot in his mouth. Okay. 
And Peter said, well, Lord, look, everybody's all around you. And if you'll notice, the writer, Luke, says people thronged him, people pressed him, but she touched him. There's a difference. There's people thronging, there's people pressing, but she touched him. Finally, she said, it was me. I know that I might be fined. I know I might go to jail, but it was me. And Jesus said, daughter, your faith. He called her daughter. Your faith has made you whole. So in conclusion, I'm going to say, when Jesus passes by your way, are you going to say, hey, I got a need. Hey, hey, I need a touch. I need more salvation. I need Jesus to touch my body. I need help in my finances. I've got this illness in my body. Are you going to let him pass you by and stay in your blurred condition? Are you blind? Are you blurred? Or are you blessed? I hope everybody here today goes home with your socks blessed off. Okay, I'm going to ask someone if they would come to the keyboard. And we're going to sing... Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I was blind, but now I see. Shut your eyes and open them. How's your vision? Are they blurred? Is it blurred? Or are you blessed? Would you bow your heads, please? I'm just going to ask you today, and I'm not going to draw this out. I'm just going to ask you. Is there anybody here? Now, examine your heart for just a moment. This is not just pure protocol. This is not just something that we do at the end of the service because a lot of churches don't do this. We care. Is there anybody here today that is in a blind condition? You don't know Jesus. And you'd like to find Jesus before you leave the sanctuary today. Is there anybody who would say, I'm blind? Spiritually, I'm blind. And I need Jesus. Is there anybody? I'm looking. As pastor would say, I'm not going to drag this out. But I'm going to ask you, church, for just a moment to examine your heart. Are you living in a blurred state? Oh, you're saved. You're saved. But you're living in a blurred condition. You don't see things clearly. You're hurting, but you don't tell anybody. You need a touch, but you don't tell anybody. You sit in your seat, and you go home blurred. Is it pride? Is it an underlying condition? I'm here to tell you that you don't have to leave blind. I'm here to tell you that you don't have to leave blurred. I'm here to tell you you can leave blessed today. Is there anybody that would raise your hand and say, I'm in a blurred condition today? Is there anybody? I see those hands. God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. Jesus sees those hands. Jesus sees those hands. And because you have raised your hand, he will honor your honesty. And he can change your situation today. All of you that raise your hand that you're living in a blurred state, it doesn't mean there's sin in your life. It doesn't mean something's wrong. It just means that maybe you know you need a touch. Those of you that raised your hands, you need some kind of a touch this morning. Would you just stand to your feet? Would you be that honest? Would you be that honest? I see people standing all over. You just need a touch. Is there anybody else that would just stand? Say, I need a touch. Don't care what anybody else thinks. I don't care what the person besides me thinks. I want 2020 vision. I'm going to pray for you. And if you want to make your way to the front, that's fine. But I'm going to pray for you, and I want your faith and your honesty to make you leave this place today in a blessed condition. Don't leave blurred. I see people coming. Come and be honest and say, Lord, I need a touch today. Father, I'm so glad that Hebrews 13, 8 says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ is in our midst today. Oh, I can't see him. I can't go shake his hand. But I know he's here. And I pray that everyone that has been honest enough to raise their hand, anyone that's been honest enough to stand, honest enough to come to the altar and say I don't want to leave blurred but blessed God will honor 
your honesty. He will honor your faith. Thank you for listening to the Jewel City Podcast. 